All right, guys, welcome back to the Progressive Rehab and Strength Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Rory Alter, head clinical coach here at Progressive Rehab and Strength with my lovely co-host for today, Dr. John Patrizzo, who happens to also be my husband and a clinical coach here at Progressive Rehab and Strength, uh, professor in exercise science, teaches biomechanics, kinesiology, and like a million other courses that I always forget about, um, and also a strength training, barbell training, powerlifting coach. So in today's episode, John is joining us for our month on the foot and ankle in barbell training. And we wanted to have a conversation on the foot and ankle in barbell training because not we don't really see injuries happen to the foot per se while you're training but a lot of things that happen to the foot and the ankle outside of training can influence your ability to train and train well so we wanted to discuss the like how the the foot functions and what areas can become affected and are really important to barbell training so two things that i can think of are the ankle dorsiflexion and we can see this with any type of fracture or surgery um, we can get a limitation in one ankle versus the other and that can kind of affect load up the chain being dispersed evenly or not um, and then also you know people can have foot surgeries or things like bunions or um, flat feet or high arches and and this can really affect how a person's foot functions in both daily activity and under the barbell so without further ado john can you please give us a functional anatomy lesson in the foot and ankle uh okay so um the the foot and ankle is a really complex structure that uh has a lot going on from the standpoint of bones and joints right there are over 20 different bones uh, that are that make up the foot and ankle. There are over 20 joints. We have lots of, of muscles uh, that are either extrinsic muscles, which means they originate outside of the foot and ankle and they have an insertion somewhere within the foot, or intrinsic muscles, which means their proximal and distal attachments are within the foot itself, so they don't cross the ankle. But uh, so we have lots of different layers of muscle. Uh, certainly different connective tissues like the Achilles tendon and plantar fascia, right, which are uh, things that most people are familiar with. But um, probably the best place to start would be to talk about the uh, skeletal structure. So if we're talking about the ankle, uh, the ankle is formed by your distal tibia and fibula articulating with your talus, which is your most proximal uh, tarsal bone. Okay, so the talus is wedged in between uh, the tibia and fibula. Uh, the medial wall of the ankle is made up by your medial malleolus, which is part of the tibia. The lateral wall of the ankle is made up of the lateral malleolus, which is part of the fibula. So um, at that joint, that's where we get our dorsiflexion and plantar flexion from primarily. And so, can you explain what dorsiflexion and plantar flexion is for the person who doesn't know what those terms mean? Sure. So dorsiflexion uh, essentially is where you would be like picking your toes up, right? Lifting them up off of the floor. That would be ankle dorsiflexion. Plantar flexion would be the opposite as if you were doing like a heel raise, right? Pushing your heels away from the floor. Yeah, or a po pointing like a ballerina. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is the point in the episode where I usually say, if you're listening on one of the podcast platforms, just head over to our YouTube channel because we have a video of this episode with images of, with all of the anatomy and movements that we're talking about. Um, we overlay them onto our onto the podcast episode video. So if you need a clarification um, or to see visually what we're talking about, we have that over on the YouTube channel, which is linked in the description below. Okay, so uh, as far as, so that's the ankle joint, right? And we'll talk more about the movements as we, as we go through this. But as we move down into the foot a little bit, the foot is broken up into three sections. So we have the rear foot, we have the midfoot, uh, and the forefoot. So the mid, uh, I'm sorry, the, the rear foot is comprised of the talus and the calcaneus. So the talus articulates with the calcaneus and forms what's called the subtalar joint. Uh, and there's a lot of important movement that occurs at that joint uh, that we'll talk about as we 
uh, as we go through this. So then as we move you know, forward, um, you get to the midfoot. And the midfoot is something we talk a lot about in barbell training, right? Because we say it's our balance point mm -hmm. for exercises where we're standing on our feet, right? So the midfoot is comprised really of five bones. So on the medial side of the foot, we have the navicular. Uh, and then uh, we have three cuneiform bones. And on the lateral side of the foot, we have uh, the cuboid. So those are the five bones that make up our midfoot. And then the forefoot uh, is comprised of five metatarsals, which are kind of the long bones within the foot that um, lead to your toes, essentially. Uh, and then the metatarsals articulate with the phalanges. So we have 14 phalanges. Uh, so our first toe, which is our big toe, only has two. And then the other four toes each have three phalanges uh, associated with them. So those are all the bones. Um, you know, obviously there are lots of little joints and things in there. Um, we, a lot of times to just kind of simplify things, we talk about uh, the transverse tarsal joint um, uh, as being one joint when in reality it's actually several smaller joints that, uh, that we just refer to as kind of one joint. Mm -hmm. um, the metatarsophalangeal joints, right, where the metatarsal bones meet the toes, the phalanges. That's where uh, we get a lot of, you, you, well, I should say we get flexion and extension as well as AB and adduction there, but important for us to have extension uh, when we're walking, right? We mm -hmm. need to have adequate extension at those joints to have a, what we would consider to be like a normal walking pattern, mm -hmm. right? Um, so those are, those are the different bones. What about uh, the little that, sesamoid bones? Uh, so the sesamoid bones are bones that are, uh, so they are embedded in uh, the tendon of uh, our flexor hallucis brevis, I believe. Or longer, probably brevis. I think, I think the brevis, but we'll anyway. We'll check that and we'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll let us know on the, the in the video. But, but essentially they're at the bottom, they're on the undersurface of the base of your first metatarsal right mm -hmm, uh mm -hmm. so at the uh where the metatarsal is meeting the phalanges right the there ball so, of your foot yeah you essentially like the ball of the foot so when yeah. we talk about the metatarsal phalangeal joint really uh from a practical standpoint that's what people refer to as like the ball of the foot mm -hmm. so john let me ask you a question before we move forward why you know we have like two joints in our knees we got one joint in our elbow, two like one or two joints in our elbow, depending on how you look at it. And why do we have so many bones and so many joints in our feet? Well, because like I said, we, we need our foot to perform a lot of complex um, movements for us. And we get a lot of feedback from our feet because of their interaction with the ground. So, mm -hmm. um, so, in, in terms of movement, I mentioned dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So we also have a movement called inversion and eversion, uh, which is really the way I describe it to students is what we would consider to be kind of similar to abduction and adduction, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. um, but we refer to it as inversion and eversion at the foot and ankle. And we refer to abduction and adduction. So adduction is kind of like if we're pointing our toes in towards each other and abduction is if we're turning them out. Um, but in reality, because of our foot and ankle, particularly the ankle is oriented on a little bit of an oblique axis because mm -hmm. the tibia has a little bit of rotation to it. The malleoli are not lined up perfectly with each other. Um, our foot and ankle really move simultaneously through multiple planes at once. It's not like the elbow or the knee where we can like very easily isolate out mm -hmm. when we're moving in the sagittal plane versus a different right. plane. Um, There's like coupled motions in the foot. Exactly. And <clears throat> we refer to those coupled motions as pronation and supination which can also be confusing because we have pronation and supination in the, in the forearm, <laughs> right? But uh, this is a different pronation and supination. So yes, our um, feet don't flip over on us. <laughs> right, exactly. So, uh, so we, our foot and ankle really need to work together to produce this pronation and supination uh, 
depending on what we are doing with our feet. So, mm -hmm. um, so supination is a combination of inversion, a deduction well, and plantar wait, this flexion. This is inversion, a deduction and plantar flexion. Yes. And pronation is a combination of eversion, eversion abduction and dorsiflexion. There okay. you go. All right. Now, <laughs> now we don't need a video of my foot. <laughs> now, the the most important thing to understand is that when we supinate, we are making the foot rigid. And we need that rigidity for when we are transferring force into the ground. So whenever you are pushing your foot off of the ground, like you're taking a step, right? You're propelling yourself into your next step you are going to supinate at, through your foot and ankle. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is because we want the foot to turn into a rigid lever so that we can transmit force efficiently mm. from our legs into the ground and get a better ground reaction force to help propel ourselves forward, right? Sounds like other things we do in barbell training. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> then, but on the flip side of that, when we are bringing our foot down in contact with the ground, right? So when we transition, mm -hmm. let's mm -hmm. say again, we're taking a step. The first thing that should be hitting the, the floor when, you, when you're taking a step is your heel, right? Mm -hmm. So you heel strike. And then as we transition from heel strike into what we call foot flat, where the foot is coming obviously flat into, onto the ground, um, we are going to be pronating. And when we pronate, we are making the foot more flexible. So the foot becomes more flexible so that we are able to adapt, um, adapt to the terrain that we're walking mm -hmm. over, right? Uh, and also to help us disperse force, right? So we need to transmit force uh, when we're pushing off the ground, but we need to be able to disperse and absorb force when our foot is coming into contact and with the ground. And it also sounds like it widens your base of support. As, to, as well well if the foot becomes more relaxed yep. and more flexible that's correct so so um so it's really kind of interesting that the foot can alternate between these two positions based on what we're doing right mm -hmm. so supination is for rigidity and force transfer and pronation is to kind of relax the foot uh and make it more flexible so to speak um I don't so, know if you're going to talk about this, but maybe this, if you're not going to talk about this, this might be a good time to ask this question. Mm -hmm. um, so we have people who have rigid feet and we mm -hmm. have people who have very flexible feet. Usually mm -hmm. people who have rigid feet have high arches, stiff heels, stiff ankles. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we have people who have um, very flexible feet, usually have a lot of pronation, flatness, and um, ankle, like ankle mobility. So how does that affect the chain well so between those two you're right there so when we're just in quiet standing mm -hmm. ideally we would be in a fairly neutral position right so where we wouldn't be overly pronated or overly supinated uh and what you would see in that position is that the foot has a slight arch to it right and you know your heels in contact with the ground your ball of the foot is in contact with the ground, your toes, right? Um, now, what we see with people that are what we call overly pronated, right, which is more common of the two, um, they have what we would typically refer to as flat feet, mm -hmm. right? So these are people that in a normal kind of neutral position, they are pronated, essentially. Uh, and what we see there is their arches are relaxed, right? So a lot of times like the medial border of their foot is in contact with the ground. Um, so they are in uh, a pronated position, uh, basically at rest, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas someone who's overly supinated would be that kind of the opposite scenario, right? So they would have kind of a higher than expected arch uh, and more rigidity in the foot than we would typically need, you know, at rest in a neutral position. So um, again, pronation being overly pronated is more common than being overly supinated. Uh, a lot of times people that truly, um, have, uh, over supination, a lot of times there's like an underlying neurologic, uh, thing going on. So it's more common in, in that sort of population. Uh, but certainly there are just people that have a little bit of a higher arch than we would typically expect to see. Right. Um, so, you know, people who are overly pronated, they tend to have like more 
soft tissue type issues uh, in the foot and ankle, things like plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, posterior tibi, uh, tibialis tendonitis. Really, we should be saying tendinopathy, right? Mm-hmm. If we want to be more uh, <laughs> technically correct, but um, <laughs> politically correct in terms of <laughs> medical <laughs> terms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's funny because like working in a working in a PT practice, there are no all doctors still use tendonitis, you know, yes. on their prescriptions and no stuff like that. But but in the, in the PT world, that's like, you know, frowned upon now, yeah. you know, so say tendinopathy, but, but you understand, <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying, yes, right? So yes, we, yes. and, and we tend to see more of those like overuse type injuries mm-hmm. because those tissues, you know, from a mechanical standpoint are going to be under a little bit more stress because of how relaxed the foot is. Right. <clears throat> um, now, however, however, I do want to chime in. Mm-hmm. Um, Yes, they're more susceptible to those types of sensations, but we have to remember that, and this this is a conversation I think that we can definitely have maybe at the end, but you know, people will always ask me, because I have flat feet, do I need orthotics or should I get orthotics or should I use a specific shoe or this and that? And old school Rory used to think, yeah, like you have flat feet, we need to correct the arch, blah, 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 blah. But what I have found is that more often than not, when you try to conform someone's foot to what the, it's not natural, what's not natural for their body, they tend to have more issues. And um, everything is adaptable. So if you're doing load management correctly with your feet, so you're not going from sitting all day for the last three years at a desk job to a standing job, Um, and you're gradually building up to whatever you're working on with your feet, like you're not just going for a four mile hike, you're building up to a four mile hike, and you're not just randomly going for a two hour walk with your dog, Um, you know, you're going to be able to have flat feet without having problems. Yeah, I would agree with that 100%. I mean, I am not a big proponent of orthotics at all and i can tell you i've had multiple custom orthotics made for me over the years and i have never worn more one of them for more than like a week yeah i mean your your feet are beyond you know repair but uh that's not true (laughs) no uh, for everybody listening they're they're, no my feet really aren't that bad (laughs) they're they're shock shockingly bad they're no they're not stop it they're really not that bad (laughs) I wear open toe shoes and no one says, Oh my God, she needs to leave the party. Like no well, one says that. <laughs> not, not, not to you, but you know, people have approached me before and, you know, commented. Aye, aye, aye. So uh, anyway, um, yeah, I, I am not a proponent of orthotics. Like your experience has been the overwhelming majority of people that get them do not like them. Um, you know, if you've had flat feet your entire life and then you try and jam them into this Mm -hmm. position, that's not natural for them, especially with a very rigid orthotic, Mm -hmm. like a lot of them are. Mm -hmm. Um, and most people do not take the time to build up their tolerance to them. Yeah. They just want to put them in their shoes and go. They, it doesn't end up well, right? Most people don't wear them for very long and Mm -hmm. they just end up stopping to use them. And, and to your point, You know, uh, I think that a lot of people that do end up with some of those issues that are overly pronated, it usually is from, you know, a a really high spike in activity that they weren't really prepared for, you know, and there are plenty of people that are overly pronated that never have any issues. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and I wouldn't suggest that they go get an orthotic if they're not having any issues. And Mm -hmm. if they are having an issue then, you know, you can find out what the underlying cause was. You can work on muscle strengthening and flexibility and things like that and increase their tolerance, uh, increase their tolerance to, um, you know, stress over time. And, mm-hmm. you know, most of them will do just fine, mm-hmm. you know? So, mm-hmm. so yeah, I, I agree with you. And I'm, I'm not a big proponent of orthotics. Yeah. Mm-mm. Especially, especially when you're not having problems with your foot and you go somewhere to like let's say you just go to like a specialized shoe shoe store for running or something like that and you're buying a a sneaker for running and they're like you should get these inserts don't do it absolutely don't do it and even i mean john you just went to the acsm conference and saw some really good um lectures on 
footwear and these like zero type shoes and stuff like that and you have some new insight and beliefs about them as well but um in my experience and what i've as as a prior endurance athlete and a prior dancer as well in my experience the more you try and control the foot the worse the foot becomes um so you know find what shoe is best for you and what you've been comfortable with and the most important thing is just load management and making sure that you're adapting over time to what you're trying to do versus like sure like literally anyone who gets a puppy who's never had a dog before and now starts to go on walks three or four times a day and they weren't doing that before like you're everybody's going to be tired from that and experience aches and pains in their body's weakest link you know so that's kind of the philosophy on the foot for us yeah. in terms of orthotics and shoes it's just a it's just about progressive overload like mm -hmm. it is with the training with like Everything. it is with a, a barbell training yeah. program you know and uh yeah i i agree and I, I think ultimately when it comes to footwear really what's comfortable for you is is probably what's most important rather than being like very rigid about the type of shoe and things like that but to your point about like trying to force the shoe your the foot into a position um you know I, I would look at it kind of similar to like immobilization right like what happens when we immobilize mm -hmm. a part of the body well typically the tissues right they become weaker they atrophy mm -hmm. that, things like that right so it's really not that different in my opinion when you're looking at the the foot right we want a, a strong kind of flexible foot um so you have to work towards that, you know, mm -hmm. and it's something that happens gradually over time. Uh, if you're constantly just trying to look for more and more and more support, you know, that's kind of like putting a, a Band-Aid on the issue, but you're mm -hmm. not really getting to the underlying, you know, mm -hmm. uh, cause of your problems, you know. Yeah, um, I want to I know that we have to talk more about the foot, <laughs> the joints and the and the muscles and stuff like that. But I want to pause here because we are, are talking about the ankle joint and foot mobility. So I want to pause here to just talk about ankle mobility and barbell training, mm -hmm. um, specifically the squat. Um, because John, I bet every single month or week someone asks you or tells you that they can't squat to depth because of their ankle mobility. Um, <laughs> so, um, and this, you know, this happens to me, it happens mm -hmm. to Alyssa, it happens all over the internet and people are, you know, preaching about, you've got to work on your ankle mobility if you want to improve your squat. But first of all, <clears throat> we're going to say that most everybody, if you've never had a traumatic injury or immobilization to your foot has the ankle mobility to perform a squat to depth. A back squat to depth um, and the the type of squat and the position of your torso and hips relative and your knees relative to your ankle will dictate how much ankle mobility you need in a squat but if you've got good coaching and you are a normal person who has not had any type of trauma or immobilization or injury to the foot you should 99% Point nine percent of you should be able to squat to depth um, without any type of footwear. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of look at ankle mobility specifically when we're talking about lifters, right? Mm -hmm. Like as in a similar way that, you know, you hear people say, oh, I can't squat that low because my hamstrings are tight. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's mm -hmm. it's that's not what's stopping you. Mm -hmm. You know, usually it's just poor positioning, mm -hmm. you know, not using a, the right stance for you, for your body type or whatever. Uh, and like you said, you know, really it, it is a little bit on a spectrum, like a front squat is going to require the greatest amount of ankle mobility because the torso is more upright, the knees travel more forward. Right. Um, Whereas a high bar squat would be a little bit less. And then a mm -hmm. low bar squat would require the least amount of ankle mobility. Right. So it's just, it's kind of all on a spectrum, but, uh, but I agree. Um, there's no reason why the average person who doesn't have a history of like significant ankle injury uh, shouldn't be able to get into a good squat position um, because of their ankle mobility or flexibility. You yeah. Know? So let's just quickly talk about the actual mechanics of what's happening at the ankle 
between the shin bones and the feet in a squat. Well, so if we're talking about a squat, your feet are fixed, right? So mm -hmm. your feet are fixed in place. So really what's happening is the tibia and fibula, as the knee flexes, mm -hmm. they are inclining forward slightly, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And as they incline forward, and again, it depends on your build, your anthropometry, the type of squat you're doing, et cetera, right? There are mm -hmm. some power lifters who try and get no forward movement of the tibia right when they're squatting but i don't think that's really ideal for for most people but that's something that some people try and do but for most people when you squat you know the tibia is going to incline forward as the knee flexes and as the hip flexes so um what's really going on there is the tibia is sliding forward relative to the talus right that's uh that's stationary essentially mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. under underneath it mm -hmm. uh, and that's what's creating closed chain dorsiflexion, right? So we mm -hmm. said before, dorsiflexion is like when you lift your toes mm -hmm. up off of the floor. Well, in reality, dorsiflexion is just making that it's angle. It's the approximation of right. the Right, it's segments. making the, the angle more acute between mm -hmm. your foot and your tibia. So yep. if your foot's flat on the ground and you're bringing your tibia forward, then you're dorsiflexing, you know? Right. So so um, <clears throat> when people say they don't have the ankle mobility to squat, really what they're saying is they're lacking the dorsiflexion range of motion to squat, you know? Yeah. So in the front squat, your knee is going to translate much more forward than it does in a back squat. And when your knee translates more forward, that means that you're closing that shin, the shin or the the tibia is coming angling more forward so you're closing that ankle that a ankle angle <laughs> that angle between the foot and the the shin bone and that is going to be like this so like a goblet squat or a front squat are going to create require the most ankle dorsiflexion um, and your trunk is going to be much more upright but then when you move the bar to your to your traps for let's say a high bar back squat your back is going to incline a little bit more your hips are going to go back a little bit further so your knees don't translate as as far forward as they do in the front squat which means that angle in between the shin and the foot is not as acute which means you don't need as much ankle dorsiflexion for the high bar back squat as you do for the front squat. And then the same thing with the low bar back squat, when we move that bar lower down on the, sh on the shoulders or on the back, it creates a more horizontal back angle. So your hips go back further and your knees don't translate as far forward, meaning that you have a more open angle in the front of the ankle, therefore requ requiring the least amount of ankle dorsiflexion for squatting. So um, most people can squat uh, a low bar squat without requiring any ankle mobility um, assistance. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. Just, just one thing to add to that, um, the position of your feet mm -hmm. also affects how much dorsiflexion mm -hmm. you need. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're uh -huh. if yep. you if your toes are pointing straight forward, yep. then that's going to require more dorsiflexion at the ankle than if you have them turned out a little for bit for any so, of the squats. For any of the yes. squats. So the more you turn out your toes, the less dorsiflexion you're going to need. Can you explain why that's the case? Well, so we said dorsiflexion and plantar flexion basically occurs in the sagittal plane, right? Mm -hmm. So when your toes are pointing straight forward, really the only way to move is through that sagittal plane. When we turn out a little bit, mm -hmm. now we're kind of starting to move into the frontal plane, right? And, and we're just uh, getting a little bit more freedom of movement um, at all of our joints, right? Mm -hmm. So the hip, the hip mm -hmm. is going to abduct and externally mm -hmm. rotate more, right? Uh, the knee just flexes and extends, but uh, <laughs> the the net result of that outward movement of mm -hmm. the thighs means less forward knee travel, which means less dorsiflexion at the ankle. There you go. Um, so there's a couple of things that we can do from a mechanical standpoint for squatting that allows us to have enough ankle mobility to squat to depth with our feet flat on the floor. Um, the other element to squatting is knowing how to move and knowing how to position your body in space and being aware of what your body is doing in space 
Um, so if you're not getting your knees out and you are, you know, like if you don't know these things and you're trying to squat with your toes forward or someone's coaching you to squat with your toes and knees straight forward or someone is picking the front squat for you when it's not the appropriate thing and not necessary for your sport or your um or your goals, then of course you might have difficulty squatting if you do have some ankle restriction. But the amount of ankle restriction required to restrict a squat means that you probably can't walk normal or go up and down stairs normally. So if you can't, or, and it means that like, you know, you're not sitting on a low toilet um, with your, you can't sit down on a low toilet with your feet flat, you know? Um, so, this concept that people say that the reason your squat is difficult or not good or not to depth is really bs because unless you have restrictions in those other things like walking um and uh climbing up and down stairs like think about it when you put your foot on a stair uh, the higher step you have to lean forward and translate your knee forward so you require it to keep your foot flat on that step requires a lot of dorsiflexion so if you can do that and if you can walk normally and you can get up and down from a, to a toilet normally with your feet flat on the floor then you've got the mobility to at least low bar squat um so let's say you do have some restriction but you're but you want to high bar squat or you want a front squat for whatever reason or you do have restrictions in your ankle that you know make it difficult to to squat which we don't really see it a lot I'm telling you um why John do you why do let's say why do Olympic lifters Olympic weightlifters use a squat shoe or a weightlifting shoe so a weightlifting shoe, well, first I'll say most shoes today, right? Most sneakers have mm -hmm. uh, an elevated heel, right? So mm -hmm. they have what's called like a heel wedge where the back of the shoe has more support, mm -hmm. right? Than the front of the shoe. Um, Which so also could be why we have a lot of foot problems in this world. <laughs> maybe, but it, so, so that's called like a heel differential, right? Mm -hmm. Most weightlifting shoes have like a three quarter inch heel on them, right? So that's the difference between how high it is in the back mm -hmm. versus the front. And you can find some different heights or some that are more, mm -hmm. some that are less, right? But uh, I, I would say it's most typical is probably a, a three quarter inch heel. Uh, the difference in a weightlifting shoe is that it is made from non-compressible material. Uh, and the reason that we want that is for force transfer right into the ground. Whereas like with a athletic sneaker that has cushioning, that's not really what they're looking mm -hmm. for. Right. Um, but for specifically the reason why weightlifters use those shoes is because it makes it easier to get into a deep squat position to catch your cleans and snatches because of the fact if you're if you're in that heel uh using that heel wedge you're staying in a slightly more plantar flex position at the ankle mm -hmm. and it doesn't require as much dorsiflexion to get into those deep squat positions so it makes it a lot easier <clears throat> to get down into a low yeah. squat and i want to point out that you're using the word deep squat position mm -hmm. so for olympic weightlifters they're squatting below what is a standard or typical depth for not just powerlifting competition but for optimal strength development so if you go back to our squat episode um in the lo the low the it's a 10 minute tip low bar back squat where we talk about the stretch reflex and what proper depth is that's an intentional stopping point for depth on the squat because we're still maintaining tension in our muscles and we're not be going into a position where the muscles kind of um, become a little bit loose and like not as tense to produce force. So this optimal depth position is where we can still tr translate the force that we're building in our squat and translate it into motion up. Um, but in the, when we go to depth, uh, to, to deep squats, such as in the, the weight, uh, I can't speak English today. Hmm. The Olympic lifts, you tend to see that these lifters will hang out in the bottom of that lift for a minute or a, a moment or two and like bounce a little bit. They're bouncing off their calves. Um, so they're getting this like bouncing motion to help them come back up. It's not like that stretch reflex that we start that we use in, in the main squat. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, I mean, Olympic lifters, the the they are going to squat deeper, right? As a function of their, it's very sport specific mm -hmm. for them, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not the way that we would have like a team sport athlete, mm -hmm. you know, perform the squat or a mm -hmm. power lifter, obviously, right? We want to use a long range of motion and we want you to get below parallel, but you don't have to get into like that ass to grass type right. position, right? Whereas for a weightlifter, because if they're, if they're seriously competitive, right? They're cleaning and snatching the heaviest weights they can. Mm -hmm. They are getting into that deep squat position as a function of not getting the bar right. as high, right? right? So it's like if they can get the bar on a clean to like their, you know, middle of their abdomen, and then they can squat underneath yep. it to catch it, mm -hmm. they're going to be in a really low position when they catch mm -hmm. it. So it's, it's very sport specific for them. Uh, and having a weightlifting shoe is very advantageous, right? So in a powerlifting competition, you see lots of lifters that are wearing weightlifting shoes, mm -hmm. especially on the squat and on the bench press, but it's not a universal thing, right? You see plenty of lifters that are wearing flats on both of those lifts as well. Whereas at a weightlifting competition, you'll never see right. a weightlifter in flats. They're right. all wearing weightlifting shoes and because also, it, because it gives them an mm -hmm. advantage in their lifts. Yeah. And be, even in a front, like you, most people like can perform a front squat to traditional, um, or sorry, non weightlifting specific depth. So like just the hip crease coming below parallel without requiring a weightlifting shoe. But then because they're going so deep in competition or in their sport specific lifts, those knees are translating more forward than they would if you were just going to depth. Um, so they really do um, benefit uh, from the, the, the heel. Um, I would say that that's a lot of ankle dorsiflexion and it could be you might be inhibited from performing those lifts if you didn't have those shoes on um but to your point about powerlifting competitions where we do see some people who are wearing weightlifting shoes and some people who aren't the one of the benefits of wearing a weightlifting shoe designed for olympic weightlifting is that the shoe is so rigid and the, the shoe is so flat on the bottom and the the um, the area that of the bottom of the shoe is actually larger than most shoes um, because it actually comes out to the in, it's the entire area of the bottom of your foot it goes a little bit wider it has a metatarsal strap the shoe itself is very stiff um, like you don't feel there's not a lot of movement in the shoe so you're not losing force when you're transferring force from your legs into the ground to move the bar most of that force is being transferred into the ground. Whereas if you have a softer shoe that allows your foot to dis like displace more, um, you're losing some force out to the sides and into the compressibility of the shoe. Um, but we'll have a whole episode on footwear. So do not stress my friend. <laughs> um, okay. So we've talked. So most people, like 99% of you, unless you can't go up and down stairs without a, a difficulty and and you can't walk without difficulty in your ankle, um, then you've got the mobility in your foot to squat and you don't need to be doing 20 minutes of ankle mobility and wearing special shoes if you don't want to. Um, so let's talk about the, I guess, is it, do you want to talk about like ligaments or tendons or muscles? Like what's next on your, well, sure. Your so outline here? Um, I don't have an outline, but <laughs> and this... no, I mean like, well, what would you teach in your class? Like you start with the bones and then what's next? <laughs> so we, we go through the bones and then the joints. And then, um, typically I would talk about the ligaments and then finish up with like the muscles and that sort of thing. So, All right, let's go. um, <laughs> so in terms of ligaments, we have medial ligaments, right? And lateral ligaments. So on the medial side of the ankle joint, we refer to the ligaments as the deltoid ligaments. Um, and the, those are very strong ligaments that are not really commonly injured, right? It would take uh, an eversion, a large amount of like valgus at the ankle to, uh, to damage those ligaments. And what we typically see if there's a force like that applied is that you'll actually get an avulsion fracture, you know, before you'll tear those ligaments. So they're strong. Mm -hmm. um, 
whereas on the lateral side of the ankle, right, those are the most commonly injured ligaments that we have. And those are injured from like an inversion sprain, right? What most people would say, like they roll their, their ankle. ankle, right? Be careful so, when you go down those curbs, people. <laughs> yeah, rolling their ankle, right? So the basically they roll up onto the lateral border of their yep. foot and that puts a lot of uh, varus stress on <clears throat> those on those ligaments. So there are three ligaments there your anterior talofibular ligament, your posterior talofibular ligament, and your calcaneofibular ligament. So essentially, they all attach to the fibula, and they either attach to the calcaneus or the talus bone, right? The anterior talofibular ligament is the most commonly injured of those three. Um, but when we have a lateral ankle sprain, which is very common, uh, we typically see uh, a little bit of instability in plantar flexion. Um, and, you know, obviously depends on the severity of the injury, right? Ankle sprains occur or any sort of ligament sprain occurs on a three-point scale, right? So a grade one is kind of a minor injury. Grade two is like a partial tear. And a grade three is a full tear, right? So the ligament is fully torn. Um, I'm and tell you mentioned avulsion. So um, for the other side of the foot, but why don't you, cause we do see avulsions on the lateral side. So mm -hmm. what is an avulsion? So an <laughs> if people have not heard an avulsion, you can have an avulsion fracture from a tendon or a ligament, right? So as you've had experience yes. with, have you, <laughs> so yeah, uh, we have an episode on it. If oh, anybody okay. wants to know about my avulsion fracture, it was in my hip. So you can go, there's an episode on that. So the, uh, that's when a ligament or a tendon pulls so hard on a bone that it pulls a piece of the bone off, right? Yeah, Essentially, so the, it's so, not the tendon or ligament that tears; it's right. that it breaks the bone. It, right, exact. So, so with the deltoid ligament, what we see is that the ligament itself is not tearing, but it's it's actually pulling a piece um, of the tibia off uh, off of the bone. And that happens with the lateral ankle ligaments also. it can it can yeah. happen with the lateral ligaments as well but they're more likely to tear before you have an avulsion mm -hmm. you know um yeah. so anyway keep going well no i mean those those are really the ligaments that we tend to see the biggest problems mm -hmm. with now some people might be familiar with the term like a high ankle sprain mm -hmm. uh that's certainly not something that we see in like barbell training but in in athletics we see it you know yeah um, i mean we don't see like these injury well we'll have an episode on common injuries to the mm -hmm. foot and ankle but i think i said this at the beginning of the episode for those of you who are listening we don't see a lot of foot and ankle injuries in barbell training specifically because our feet are planted on the floor um and the type of injuries we see <laughs> that happen in training are like dropping a plate on your foot um or you know stubbing your toe <laughs> or something like that we really don't see um injuries uh happen because of barbell training specifically so right i mean like have it, you i can't think of anything no 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 uh you know like you said sometimes uh, people injure their foot or ankle outside of the gym and mm -hmm. then it affects their training. Right. But we right. usually don't see injuries in training. I mean, right. I've had some people that have ruptured Achilles, you know, doing plyometrics and stuff like oh, that, yeah, you but know, that's but, not barbell training, but that's so. not right. That's not within the context right. of barbell right. specific training, you know? Um, so, so just quickly, a, a high ankle sprain is where the talus gets wedged so forcefully up in between the tibia and fibula that it actually damages the ligaments that are holding those two bones together. So that's for, for an athlete, that's usually a more significant injury than like a lateral ankle sprain, you know, just sounds bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, talk to us about the muscle. I mean, should we talk about the aponeuroses or anything like that? Well, the retinaculum, the, sorry. The retinaculums. Nah. 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 No. Don't worry about it. <laughs> our retinaculums just hold our, really, I guess when we talk about from a muscular and tendons uh, perspective, we've got mu uh, muscles that originate on the shin bone that cross into the foot, and they're long tendons that cross into the foot. So these um, retinaculums are these fibro, these fiber cart. What, how would we talk, call it? Uh, well, they're just connective tissues, connective essentially. Tissue. There you go, connective tissue. That uh, that are keeping the tendons 
in Together. close proximity to the bones, essentially, yeah. right? So we, we when we have long tendons, and we have the same sort mm -hmm. of setup in the wrist and hand yeah, because- We haven't spoken about that on the podcast yet. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, but it's the same sort of setup where we mm -hmm. have these long tendons. Uh, basically, these connective tissues keep the tendons in contact with the bones because if we didn't have them, when you would contract the muscles, some of the tendons would pull away from the bone and we would lose some of the force transfer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's exactly. the job of the retinaculum. Um, now, in terms of when you said aponeurosis, really that's the, Between, the plantar yeah. aponeurosis. Mm -hmm. We'd be talking about the plantar fascia mm -hmm. if you wanted to talk no, about that. No. No? I mean, I get, yeah, you know what? We should because people, a very common foot um, – dysfunction or disorder i hate to say pathology pathology i hate to say injury because usually it's not a direct injury it's not like a acute injury it's like a chronic injury mm -hmm. um but plantar fasciitis so plantar fasciitis uh, well let's just talk about the plantar fascia first mm -hmm. if we're gonna if we're gonna do another episode on injuries we can't keep talking yeah. about injuries now <laughs> otherwise there's no point in doing that episode yeah i know right so Plan <coughs> the plantar fascia is a <coughs> keep coughing. I, I, I mean, keep talk. Well, if I'm coughing, you can just keep talking because I can take it out. Oh, all right. These yeah. are all the behind the scenes things that I have no idea about. Mm -hmm. I'm just the talent. <laughs> oh, keep going. So, um, so the plantar fascia is a, a, a dense piece of connective tissue that runs from the bottom of the calcaneus to the proximal phalanx bones, right? So they, it essentially crosses the metatarsophalangeal joints. It crosses the ball of the foot. So what that means is that when we go into extension at the MTP joints, right, like when we're pushing off of the ground, the plantar fascia is going to be put under some tension, right? And that tension actually helps to reinforce the arch of the foot uh, and is one of the things that helps to like lock our foot into supination. Um, so that's referred to as the windless effect. So the plantar fascia does have a function. Um, and on the other end of the calcaneus... Don't remove the plantar fascia. <laughs> do they ever do that? I don't think they do that. Well, you can rupture your plantar fascia, yeah. So that, that can happen. They typically... My experience with that is that they don't repair it, but I've obviously I'm working with more like everyday people, you know, I don't know for a like pro level athlete if they would surgically repair it. But um, on the other end of the calcaneus is uh, the Achilles tendon, right? And there's some evidence actually that the connective tissues between the Achilles tendon and the plantar fascia is actually kind of continuous, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's almost like the same long piece of connective tissue. Now the Achilles tendon uh, is our largest and thickest, strongest tendon that we have in the body. Um, and we use it to our advantage, right? When we are, um, you know, performing just everyday movements, right? To help us uh, generate force when we're, um, you know, going from dorsiflexion to plantar flexion, things like that, right? Um, Reaching up for things in the cabinet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, the the the... <laughs> The Achilles tendon basically works like a spring for us, essentially, you know. Um, but despite the fact that it's our largest uh, and most robust tendon in the body, it still doesn't prevent us from injuring it, right? Uh, and uh, there's still lots of people that, you know, have Achilles tendinopathy, and uh, certainly Achilles tendon ruptures are common, um, you know, in team sports, uh, athletics, and and that sort of thing. So, um but what the Achilles tendon does is it attaches our calf muscles to our heel bone, right? So, um, and in particular, it's the plantar flexor muscles. So the gastrox, the soleus, um, and the plantaris all uh, connect to the Achilles tendon and um, insert to the calcaneus there. What's next, John? <laughs> Well, so so your plantar flexor muscles, right, are obviously going mm -hmm. to be used mm -hmm. every time we take a step and we're pushing off the ground. If we're talking about sports, obviously they're heavily involved in running and jumping and, and those sorts of things. If we're talking about the Olympic lifts, obviously they come into play 
more significantly than if we're talking about squats or deadlifts and that sort of thing. If we're talking about the squats, deadlifts, presses, you know, they're working more as like a stabilizer mm-hmm. than they are like How actively do they participating. As stabilizers in the squat and deadlift and press. Well, essentially, uh, well, it's a little bit different for like the gastrox versus the soleus because the gastrox crosses the knee joint, right? Mm-hmm. So what that means is that one, they can assist with knee flexion depending on, you know, what type of knee flexion we're doing. But if we're talking about something like the squat, what it means is that we're dorsiflexing at the ankle while we're simultaneously flexing at the knee. Mm -hmm. And that means that there's probably not a big net change in length of the gastrox, right? Probably why we don't get sore in our calves from squatting. Yeah, there's really no eccentric Mm -hmm. like component to it. But uh, the soleus doesn't cross the knee joint. It's only a plantar flexor, right? And that's the muscle that's deeper to uh, the gastrox. The gastroc is more superficial. Um, so when we're going into dorsiflexion and the tibia is inclining mm-hmm. forward, right? They uh, are essentially working to on the backside of the tibia to keep us stable and balanced, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. they're going to be contracting, Um but it's going to be more of like an isometric, Mm -hmm. you know, type of contraction um, than, well, I guess for the soleus, right. It's going to be slightly, Mm -hmm. slightly eccentric, eccentric, but the gastrox is going to be mostly an isometric type Mm -hmm. of contraction uh, just to provide us some posterior stability. Mm -hmm. Um, And for people like, let's say if they've torn their Achilles, right. And they're coming back from that sort of injury, you know uh, they'll have significant, atrophy in those muscles when they go to squat they'll be able to feel the difference you know they, yep. they will feel off balance to a certain extent because they don't have that same you know mm-hmm. posterior mm-hmm. force being exerted by those uh by those muscles you know and that would be a scenario where we would want to build up a heel in <clears throat> under someone uh when they're reintroducing to squatting after an achilles s- surgery because you're not going to have as much ankle mobility after being immobilized in plantar flexion um, while the the surger, the surgical site is healing. So mm-hmm. our reintroduction to squat might not just be a mini squat, you know, like a, a not a full depth squat. You know, obviously when we go back to, to any of our um, post-operative reintroduction to lifts, we're not poss- po- we're probably not doing full range of motion initially. So we might do like a higher squat, but also elevate the heels more than even in a weightlifting shoe. Um, we might put something under the heels just to allow them to squat a little bit more at the knee um, and not over stretch the Achilles while we're reintroducing that motion. Yeah, I mean, people after an Achilles tendon uh, surgery, they're going to be um, immobilized in a boot that puts them in a little bit of plantar flexion, like you said. And it's probably somewhat similar to the height of a weightlifting shoe. So Mm -hmm. I haven't had to put anybody in anything higher than that. But certainly I I would agree, you know, you don't want to go from that boot to like being totally flat and trying to squat. You know, you're, Mm -hmm. you're probably one won't have the mobility and two, you probably don't want to put that much tension through mm-hmm. the repair mm-hmm. uh, very early on in the rehab process. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So what other muscles we have the ant? Oh, you well, know, then- we didn't really, t- I mean the, the, the shin is the, there, there's compartments in our shin, in our, mm-hmm. in our shin. We have our anterior or posterior. Is that it? I can't remember. No, there, there are lat. Three, there's a lateral four. compartment. There, yeah, there are multiple different compartments of muscle in, in not only in the the leg, um, but also in the foot. You know, mm-hmm. there are different there are different layers. So, uh, the anterior compartment, uh, the posterior compartment is going to be your plantar flexors, right? Mm-hmm. We have a deep posterior compartment, which is going to have uh, like your posterior tibialis, right, and uh, the. Mm-hmm. Uh, And then the lateral compartment, that's going to be uh, your Mm everters, so your peroneal muscles, which uh, I guess the newer textbooks call the fibularis, right, Mm -hmm. longus and brevis. And then anteriorly, you have your anterior compartment, which um, you have your dorsiflexor muscles. So So anterior and lateral muscles, dorsiflex and evert, Mm -hmm. and pronate. Well, no. 
No. Well, I mean, <laughs> pronation occurs as a function, as a function of, of that. Well, at, as a function of us putting weight through oh, okay. the foot and ankle, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, so I wouldn't think of it as much in like open chain, you know, mm-hmm. as I mm-hmm. would like closed chain. Gotcha. Um, but, uh, but you know, anteriorly, and- the anterior tibialis, that's your primary dorsiflexor, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, that muscle obviously plays an important role with our everyday function, right? We have to be able to pick our foot up. Um, as we're going through the swing phase, we, w- during the gait cycle, we dorsiflex to help us clear the ground. We are in a dorsiflex position when we're about to strike the ground so that we can land with our heel first. So people that have like foot drop, right? What's the thing that you can tell they're slapping Mm -hmm. their foot on the ground because of the fact that they can't dorsiflex, they can't lead with their heel, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so dorsiflexors, they play an important role from a functional standpoint. So if you've ever run through an airport from one end to the other to catch your flight and then realized you left your computer on the other plane and run all the way back that's never happened to me who why who would (laughs) that computer who would that happen to to jet over to the other end of the airport with your computer to make your flight um you might have sore shins the next day and we've called those like shin splints and that is uh because your anterior tibialis muscle was on overdrive and you might have a functional foot slap the next day because your muscles hurt too much and that would be me i yes i did that i left my computer on the plane once but they found it and they had it um so yeah don't do that <laughs> i would agree when did that happen again you were by yourself that uh, wasn't yes with me. that was coming back from the coaches conference oh or liz's i can't remember I think the mm. coaches conference. So, anywho. Well, I mean, I think we've talked about a lot of the basic functions of the foot, right? I mean, I don't know how well, in we depth really... you want to get it with some of these muscles and I think what I want to talk about as it pertains to the muscular component of the foot is um and I think maybe this might actually go into like Talk about the intrinsic and not, I wouldn't say like individual muscles, but just talk about the intrinsic versus extrinsic foot muscles and like what the difference is in terms of proprioception, balance, and strength. Because if that makes sense, because I think then we can, when we talk about footwear, you know, like do we have to really isolate and strengthen the muscles of the feet individually? Um, Well, that's a good question. So, you know, like some of the muscles that we've talked about, like the gastrox and the soleus and the anterior tibialis and the, you know, uh, fibularis longus and brevis and posterior tibialis, all those muscles are extrinsic, right? They all originate either some of them like the gastrox on the femur, but most of them are originating on the uh, tibia or the fibula and they're crossing the ankle joint and attaching somewhere to to the foot. Um, The intrinsic muscles, we have several layers of them um, within the foot and they are, I don't want to say all of them, but many of them are on the bottom of the foot, right? And, uh, they, uh, are essentially the muscles that flex the toes and AB and adduct, uh, the toes. So, um, now we don't have as much like fine motor control of our toes as we do with like, let's say our, our fingers, right? Obviously, um, because we do much more complex type movements with our fingers. But uh, I do think that, you know, you should have some decent mobility between, you know, the different toes and, and things like that, right? And be able to have some control over, you know, your flexion and extension and A, B and A deduction. Uh, and you could, you know, there are exercises like in if you wanted to get into like the nitty gritty of rehabilitation, mm-hmm. you know, let's say if you had a bunionectomy or something, right? There may be some some isolation type exercises that you would do to try and regain, you know, some function in, in those muscles. But uh, what those muscles do um, collectively is help to support the arches of the feet, right? So we have essentially we have a transverse arch of the foot that we can see. Um, 
kind of running medially to laterally, and that <clears> runs <throat> through the midfoot, so the cuneiforms, right, the navicular, the, the cuboid, we talked about those. And then we have a longitudinal arch, which if we were looking from the side, basically runs from the calcaneus to the metatarsal heads, right, at the ball of the foot. So, um, so those intrinsic muscles, in addition with some help from some of the extrinsic muscles, like the posterior tibialis and the fibularis longus, uh, help to reinforce the arch of the foot, the arches of the feet. And the arches are important because they help us with force transfer and load distribution and things like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that if we're going to do a separate episode in terms of like injuries and footwear and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of a, a good place to, to stop, you know, is talking about the arches because so much of what we see with people, whether it's from, you know, a pain and injury standpoint with their foot or, you know, what gets hyped up in the footwear world, you know what I mean? In terms of what's important for you to look for in, in an athletic shoe or whatever, you know, everything is about the arches, you know, you see mm -hmm. advertisements for Dr. Scholl's and all this stuff. Right. So, um, so those muscles help to reinforce the arch. So, you know, doing some strengthening work for them, maybe that helps your arch a little bit right now yeah, but i want to so what before before you go on i want to just bring in my own perspective um on on arch issues foot mm -hmm. issues and like isolated strengthening mm -hmm. um versus not so and this is something that i have seen with other clients of mine though i'm not a foot expert I do not deal with a lot of ankle injuries oh, ankle injuries I I have done Achilles um, rehab uh, rehab for for um, for fractures and all that stuff but when we get into like below the ankle in the foot I don't do that um, <clears throat> I don't that's just I don't I don't get those clients from my own perspective and my own experience as um, an athlete and as a dancer, uh, an endurance athlete, and then moving into uh, powerlifting, again, like I don't run anymore, but I did run for the first couple of years that I was doing barbell training. Um, I had extensive foot pain when I was just endurance training, when I was running, when I was cycling even when I was swimming I would get foot cramps just because my foot feet couldn't handle like the amount of planner quick planner and, uh, and dorsiflexion that was going on while I was swimming and um I had gone to physical therapy multiple times they had me doing like you know the traditional like toe stuff and band stuff and ankle and like balance bullshit excuse my language and um when, so not professional. when you and this is kind of what led me into using the barbells for rehabilitation is when you introduced me to strength training with barbells, I started to have significant reduction in my plantar fasciitis in my bunion pain, my constant arch pain, my posterior. I mean, I had everything. I was getting injections in my um, in my uh, planner um, in my uh, posterior tibialis region um, because I had so much pain in my ankle um, in that in that area and obviously I don't um, do endurance sports now I don't run for for because I'm not interested in it but I even before I started running I had constant foot pain my whole life and when I stopped trying to confine my feet to stiffer footwear to control my arches and when I started doing full body strengthening that required my feet as the base of support my arch pain and my constant foot pain went away and the only time I get pain in my feet now is if I am really like standing all day like all day um I, you know, and even I used to be, I would stand in the clinic with um, a not barefoot shoe and I would feel terrible. If I put a barefoot shoe on, my legs, my feet, everything felt a lot better. Um, so, and I wasn't doing any of the foot strengthening um, well, at that so, point. So this is what I'll, I'll say about that. One, 
I mean, I agree with you. I think obviously, I mean, taking a more full body systemic approach mm -hmm. to training and rehabilitation is going to be superior to any sort of isolation approach, you know? So when I talk about isolation exercises, they're only ever used as an adjunct or supplement to like the in your rehabilitation well, not, right, not right. like someone but, else's but with and i think the failing of a lot of these isolation exercises especially when we're talking about the foot mm -hmm. is how the do you progress how body. do you how do you progressively right. load them you mm -hmm. can't you know so it's more about like i think you know the purpose of doing them you're not really going to strengthen them significantly mm -hmm. right um now a lot if you, of it is about mobility and control and blood and flow. pro and proprioception yes, and things yes, like that yes. right um but yeah in terms of strengthening like if you're squatting and you get your squat from 100 pounds to 200 pounds well then your feet are going to be stronger mm -hmm. you know and i think in your case you know while you were getting stronger at the same time you were also decreasing the amount on, yeah. of endurance work so i think that combination is mm -hmm. probably why your feet um, started to feel so much better, you know? Yeah. And we talk about this, um, in, in all the episodes with Brie on the, on the pelvic floor, um, you can't load it just like you yeah. can't progressively load the feet. You right. know, the only way to progressively load the feet, the only way to progressively load the pelvic floor is to load the body. Um, so like a green TheraBand can only be a green, a green TheraBand. It can literally only be a green TheraBand. <laughs> <laughs> but a 45-pound barbell can end up being a 405-pound barbell. So, um, yeah. So that, we do that, that was really deep. I think that's a good place to end. Yeah, that, that was deep. That was um, deep. <laughs> anyway, that's enough. Um, if you've got questions pertaining to this episode or this this type of content, you can definitely check out the links in the show description below. You can submit questions, you can um, submit topic requests, all those types of things. You can also head into our Facebook group, the free, uh, our free, my gosh, our free Facebook group, the Secret Society of Barbell Mastery, linked in the description below as well. And you can post questions. We do a live Q and A once a month that gets recorded for the podcast. So if you have questions related to the foot and ankle as it pertains to barbell training or injuries, whatnot, you can post those in the Facebook group and we'll certainly answer them when we do our Q and A session. And if you'd like to book a free call with John, myself, or any of the other PRS clinical coaches, you can also check out that link in the, um, show notes below and book a free consultation. And if we aren't the right people to help you, we will certainly point you in the right direction to someone who can or the type of care that you need. So with that, please join us the rest of the month on the podcast for all things related to foot and ankle in barbell training um, and check out our prior episodes. Uh, we've done the whole lower extremity and the back so far, and then we're going to move on into the upper extremity um, after this. So that's it. Bye for now, guys.